Good afternoon, Minnesotans. Um, once again, uh, thank you for tuning in. And uh, it hardly seems possible, but it was almost nine months to the day when COVID was first uh, showing up in Minnesota. We were getting our first cases, and uh, I addressed you on that night. And I used at the time a description and said we were entering what would be a long, dark winter of COVID-19. And I think that was an accurate description, but if you recall, I actually, I, I additionally mentioned the grit and determination of Minnesotans who are used to long, dark winters, not only used to them, they can thrive in them because we know what it takes to get through and we know what it takes to be a good neighbor. Uh, this week will mark the darkest days of our year as we move towards um, the winter uh, the winter season on the 21st, but it's also, I think, fitting. Um, this is also the week after that happens that the days start getting longer. And it sure felt like that came early this week. The sun started shining early when we arrived at the VA hospital and the first doses of vaccine were arriving. We went back yesterday and watched a, uh, one of our heroes, a frontline nurse in a COVID ward, who treats our heroes at the VA hospital in Minneapolis, uh, received the first dosage of COVID-19 vaccine. All of those things are big steps to the sun coming up and for a better day. And all of those things are to bring an end to this long, dark winter of COVID-19. And rest assured, this pandemic will end. This pandemic is starting to um, transfer, but there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of things we have to do. So I wanna take a little bit of time, Minnesota. Again, sun's rising. Things are different, things are changing, but we are not out of the woods yet. Um, we know this vaccine has a tendency, the asymptomatic spread we were just discussing here uh, before we started uh, is troubling to see a respiratory disease that does that is, is unprecedented and that causes us a lot of problems. But we've learned much in the nine months. And here's what we know, when I addressed you in November and asked for us to do a pause on some of our activities, things that we've learned over nine months contribute to the community spread, that put pressure on our hospital systems, that make it more difficult for our first responders to provide the safety and keep our children out of school. So we made that pause. Cases were growing. Families were starting to struggle and this distance learning is hard and we're gonna address that. Um, surge in hospitalization left hospitals on the brink of catastrophic capacity and we had to take actions. You're gonna hear in just a little bit from Dr. Ken Holman of CentraCare. CentraCare is, is a major uh, healthcare system uh, centered out of St. Cloud, but serves about 800,000 Minnesotans. Dr. Holman's understanding of not only delivery of healthcare, uh, the business side of healthcare, but also understanding what it takes to deliver in rural America. And he has been there as an advisor. Uh, he's also been then someone who's asked us to question all of our assumptions. How do we make this work? And those are the people we're listening to when we looked at what happened here. The graph you're looking at starts on the left side with March. That little bump you see is what we thought at the time was a major May spike, why we were trying to build up PPE, why we were trying to protect our hospitals. And then Minnesotans, you did the work. It dropped and you kept it flat. But just like Commissioner Malcolm, just like Dr. Osterholm, just like so many people predicted, COVID would come roaring back with a second wave in, accurately predicted, probably late fall, early winter. What you see there was November as it shot straight to the top. At the top of that peak or right circularly before it is where we asked you to pause on November 18th. It's where we ask folks to make very difficult decisions about not being with their family over Thanksgiving. And it's where we ask the almost untenable situation for small businesses, especially restaurants and bars, to stop doing what they do best and to stop their livelihood. Well, what you're seeing after that is the approximately three weeks afterwards, and it's coming down. But I want to note something here. As you're looking at that graph, that first bump in May put us into a caution or a red territory. The line before it starts going straight up, we have to be at least there to start taking some of the pressure off. And while it feels, and you should, I am incredibly grateful of the sacrifices you made to pull that back down, 
we've still got a ways to go. And that four-week pause was hard. Again, the social gatherings piece, and you did it. Um, as we compare data, uh, even in surrounding areas, because this tends to be very regional, Minnesota's post-Thanksgiving um, drop-off has been steeper than our surrounding states, and that is a testament to all of you. Um, we shut down those things we like to do, and again, um, it's incredibly hard. Youth sports, the advocates who are out there for youth sports. Um, if I'm not in this job, I'm in that camp. Um, it's what I did my whole life. I understand what comes out of that. It's not just about sports and winning a game. It's about the holistic part of a child and learning what it takes to be part of a team. It's the mental and physical aspects of it that tie right into academics in our schools. So I want to just be very clear. The passion around youth sports, fitness, activities, those things are healthy. And the activities and asking for that is a healthy thing. But what we know about the virus is if we're in an activity that puts people who aren't in the same family in close indoor proximity to one another for long periods of time unmasked, the spread is at the highest in that uh, setting. So what we look at is what type of activities can we still do? The evidence is pretty strong, as I said. You're making a difference. But community spread is still well above 30% in our communities. And again, just to remind you, Community spread is where we don't know where it's coming from. Community spread is when that healthcare worker stops at daycare or stops to fill up with gas. Someone who's asymptomatic and maybe doesn't have a mask on spreads that to that person. And the next thing we know, we either have a case in a long-term care facility or we have an RN or a doctor who's out. That adds to the stress in those situations. And the hospitals still remain uh, concerned about capacity. So here's what we do know again. The community spread lines, as you saw, we'd like to see it well below 10%. We certainly don't want to see it above 30%. And what you're looking in the number of cases that we're starting to see, we're not even out of the high risk category. All the work we did, all the things that the pause did, still didn't do it. And just to be absolutely clear, as sure as that sun will rise in the east, when we have higher cases, it is followed by a lag and higher hospitalizations, followed by a lag, ICU admittance, followed by the unfortunately inevitable rises in deaths. And I have to say, with all this work we've done, we're still reporting 92 deaths of our neighbors and our fellow Minnesotans today. That's the reality we're in. We've lost more Minnesotans in a six-day period than we lose an entire year on our highways on any given year. Um, and that doesn't appear at this point in time to be uh, tailing off a whole lot. Again, you're looking at case growth, the drop-off you've seen, and then you're looking at hospitalization rates. Um, I remind you, we were super worried on that first bump on the bottom chart on the hospitalization rates. One is we weren't as prepared because of PPE. We weren't as prepared and understood as much about COVID-19. Through the hard work and preparation, and Dr. Holman will talk a little bit about it, Minnesota is fairly unique in the collaboration amongst our healthcare entities that our site picture into beds and collaboration and moving patients is probably as strong as anywhere in the country. Because of that, we were able to pop above that high risk and still start to bring that down. That first drop off on the bottom chart that you see, that's where we asked folks to stay home and we closed our schools and we did some of those. And then you kept it below the high risk. And then what you're looking at is the November spike and the outrageous rise of what happened. That was what caused the pause. Your actions are why it's dropping back off on the end. But again, I would remind you, it has not come anywhere near where we need to get to down below. So again, going back to March, we asked you to flatten the curve. And I just want to be very candid with folks. I've heard people say this. Well, you keep moving the goalpost, Governor, about what we're supposed to do in this. And, and my response to that is the game continues to change. And it's no game. It's a virus that takes lives. We've learned more about it. We do know now, because of what our health care folks have done, our survival rate is higher than it was in March. We know the treatments that will work, and more of those are coming on every, every day. But we were very clear. 
We were not prepared. There was no strategic stockpile. We did not know if this was being spread by touching things as much or if it was aerosol or what was happening. So we asked to ramp up PPE, build hospital capacity. You did it. We turned the dials back down. We opened things and people were doing more. Our economy was open as any state in the nation, and our economic activity seemed to reflect that in state budget numbers. So we managed the virus over the summer. We started getting ready for schools. We issued the state learning plan, and we did the things that we needed to do that weren't ready and certainly weren't being done on a national level. We increased that capacity to storehouse PPE, to build up a testing uh, system that was state owned and wasn't dependent on supply chains outside of the state of Minnesota so that we could track this virus. And then we got to where we hoped we would always avoid, but we got to it. We got the November surge, and that really came, uh, focused on keeping folks out of the hospital the best we could. We had the PPE, but what we found out in November, late October, early November, up until right now, that we could have PPE, we could have beds, we could have ventilators, we could have the best therapeutics but you can't replace the nurse or the doctor who's out with it. You can't replace the workforce because of community spread, and you can't build up enough of that quickly enough if it comes as fast as it did. And our approach has always been, it's not about changing where the goalposts were. It's about adapting and learning what the virus is doing. It's about using new technologies and new strategies, and it was always, and it remains about, how do we control the spread of COVID-19 using the best science and the best medicine while focusing on the well-being, the holistic well-being, there's no doubt this is having immense pressures on other physical sides of people's well-being, of mental sides of well-being, of the social side of well-being, and then how do we make sure we protect the economy? Because all of those things come together. And that spot in the middle is the Stay Safe Minnesota. So we've done that. We've tried to balance that. We've tried to protect hospital capacity. And what we know now is of what we've learned, where we're at, and as we're coming over this latest peak and heading into the trough, there's a very real chance, and the probability is quite high as this virus has taken a path, that there will be another peak coming. The difference can be on this is, is what we've learned and what we can do by masking, social distancing, washing hands. And now, and I want to be very careful about this, it's going to take some time, but I also think we owe it to each and every one of us to, to celebrate a little bit this week. The vaccines are coming, not as fast as we'd like them. It's going to take some time to get that out there. But that is a change to how we approach things um, that is huge. And so we're looking at, and our next steps on this, again, to minimize death and long-term impacts. But one of the things that we know that we're prepared for, we've learned the rest of, uh, I shouldn't say the rest, there are certain states and internationally, the epidemiology around our schools provides us, and what we've learned over these several months, provides us an opportunity to get our kids back into school, into that in-person learning. So today, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to adjust the dials. And again, I, I want to just recognize this. There is nothing fair about COVID-19. And where it impacts certain industries more than others, it feels incredibly painful to those industries because it is. And we needed to make sure, and I'm proud to say in a little bit, we'll talk about that. If we're going to ask folks to sacrifice in the name of public health for their neighbors, then we as neighbors need to be prepared to help them. And that's what the legislature did this week in a nearly quarter billion dollar package of relief specifically aimed at small businesses and the hospitality industry. But we're going to support students and families. We're going to continue the effort to slow the risk uh, of spread. And we're going to protect our hospitals. That's what this is meant to do. So here's what today's announcement is. The pause ends this Friday at 11.59 p.m. What will happen starting at 12 a.m. on Saturday, the 19th, going forward is we're going to prioritize and make sure that all of this was aimed at getting our littlest learners back into the classroom. And I just want to pause for a moment and, and thank both parents. I'm trying to distance learn. My wife is trying to distance learn with our eighth grader. So many of you out there as you're working, your frontline workers, um, we've got kindergartners that should have walked through that door for the first day and been in that nurturing place where many of us, 50 years later, I can still remember Miss O'Keefe waiting at the door on that very first day. Don't think that doesn't make a lifelong impression. Don't think that that nurturing environment 
where it was bringing out the best in each one of those children, each one of those classmates who stood with me, isn't critically important. We recognize that. And the desire to get those children back in the classroom is so intense. And I want to take a moment to thank our teachers. This has been um, hellish for them to try and figure out how to deliver in person, how to shift and do hybrid, how to teach in a classroom where some of your students are on a video screen and others are separated across the room. How do you do it when some of your children don't have that access to that computer screen and you're not sure where they're at? What we know for certain is and what we found out during this pandemic, frontline healthcare workers, grocery store clerks, truck drivers, people we might have taken for granted or, or, or thought that they were just doing their job have become so invaluable. I can tell you this again, and I will clearly state I am somewhat biased because I've done it my whole life, the value of that classroom teacher, the value of not only the academics in that classroom, but the social emotional learning, that is the safest and best place for many of our children to be is in that classroom and now we believe we have both the experience the knowledge and the resources necessary to make that not only an emotionally and academically safe place but a physically health wise safe place for those students to be so what we do know is our youngest children are are less susceptible to serious complications and i don't want to minimize that one child getting COVID is too many but what we've learned is how to reduce that spread so on January 18th, every elementary school may choose in person if they can implement their strategies. And I want to be clear, some were prepared to go before that. This is going to take close collaboration because it will be local school districts and teachers along with their parents making these decisions. This is a monumental move to try and get this back into place. It's going to take us a little bit of time. Many are starting that as we speak. But talking about the sun rising, we're not too far away from that kindergartner getting that experience that I had with Miss O'Keefe and each of you had with your teachers, getting back in person in that classroom and those first and second graders. And the way we'll do this, and we'll talk in a little more detail, is we'll get the littlest ones in first and we'll start rolling back. And now the plan is, is to get that as, as soon as we possibly can and as safely as we possibly can, working with district, working with teachers, understanding that we can't lose that teacher workforce so we're going to have to be protected. We will be stepping up the testing um, in those schools uh, at a pretty high rate. All of those things we believe can protect that workforce, make that school safe, and accomplish what every single one of us knows has to be a top priority, getting a quality education for every single one of our children. We're going to do some things around small social gatherings. Um, three households with 15 people max outside. And, and here's what I just want to be clear about. Inside, we're recommending no indoor gatherings, but I want to be clear with other households. What we'd say is, and what this guidance will put out is, one additional household, 10 people max, limit your time and wear a mask. You did so much, Minnesota, throughout nine months. You continue to do it. You did it over Thanksgiving. I'm asking you not to let down at this point, but I'm also recognizing the desire to be with your family during the Hanukkah celebration, Christmas, New Year, is strong. And folks who care deeply and believe COVID is real and believe that they need to stop the spread to others still want to be with their families in a very visceral and very human way. So I've said this time and time again, doing just say no is a good theory if it was around just say no to your kids to not use drugs it's a far better thing to try and do the best we can to try and mitigate that. And I want to be clear, you're not going to take all the risk out, but there's things you can do. You can wear a mask, you can separate, keep it to one other family, try and keep that time limited to that you're there. Um, but just a clear understanding, wanting to be with your families over the holidays does not make you a bad person. It makes you a really good person. And we need to figure out how to strike that balance. Outdoor events and entertainment, Minnesotans, we're bold north people. We can thrive in this, and we do thrive in this. And, and it might be, as you see here, Christmas caroling at a safe distance with one another, getting out and doing some things together, watching what happens as you're playing some pond hockey or you're cross-country skiing together. We, we need to make sure that that happens. And gyms and fitness studios. And, and again, this isn't about one group versus another. We're all in this fight together. This is Minnesota's fight against COVID-19. This is Minnesota's fight to protect our healthcare industry. It's our Minnesota's fight to make sure that we provide the support to our businesses. So we're gonna get in there. And I, it, it's not lost on me. We're fighting a healthcare pandemic. Why would we not want people to be as healthy as they could, those that are going to gyms? I just remind folks, indoor activities 
with people close together for extended period of times with someone not from their family increases this risk of COVID spread exponentially, which leads to that cascade of cases, infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. And so what we're doing is, and I want to congratulate the folks in the, in the fitness industry, you have figured out smart ways and thought about things. So we, we hear you on that. So we're making some changes, get people back in there, make sure that they're able to, uh, to socially distance. The classes that you teach, we think you'll be able to come back on January 4th. And this next one on youth and adult sports. We need to get kids playing again. We know that. We know that the numbers show that kids aren't as susceptible, but the difference is some people ask, what's the difference between a gym and youth sports? One of the things is, is the first one, you have people separated, you have an individual, you have them masked for a shorter period of time, as opposed to different households close together with one another. These are all things that are just the nature of COVID-19. But we're coming back with them. We know we can make this work. And as I've said, this is really about the whole child. This is really about the op opportunities for them, physical, mental, teamwork, all of the things that go with it. And then the tough ones. Again, I, I, I can't say it enough times, um, this is totally unfair, and the virus has hit disproportionately into communities of color, and from a business perspective, it's hit those activities that are indoor seated or standing activities that involve extended periods of time without a mask on with people not in your family. That is the description of a bar, a restaurant, a music venue, any of those things. Um, so we're going to continue the pause on the indoor service until January 11th. Um, and we did get requests, especially from our, our breweries, um, to have outdoor service available. So outdoor service will be available. And I just want to be clear, I know we're in Minnesota, and I know it's the middle of December. Um, I know this doesn't make folks whole, but like so many of these things, we're trying to move as much as we can to mitigate the risk to provide some of that economic activity while getting the most benefit on the safety and the health side of this. So they're going to be open. And again, I would go back to this. We're bold north. The breweries tell me if we can do this, their fire pits and heaters will be open and people will be drinking brews outside uh, in December and January. Then we should make that happen if that's the, capa if that's the ability and the health department believes we can. Um, and the same thing with indoor um, venues. We'll talk some more uh, details on that. Commissioner Grove and Commissioner Malcolm will be joining me for the question and answer here following this. Um, and the biggest thing, this is what needed to be done every time. This is what the federal government needed to do continuously since May and when we did it the first time. If we are going to ask a particular business sector or someone to step out and help us with public health, it has to be coupled with the aid necessary to allow them to do that financially. And one of the things, and I want to give a big thank you to the folks in the legislature and the folks who made this happen, we're going to move just about a quarter of a billion dollars of aid as quickly as possible. I am going to sign here within the next 20 minutes or so that bill into law. We are already working out how to get those checks out over at the Revenue Department under Commissioner Doty and the help of Commissioner Grove. They're going to be directed, targeted, and help them. It's an important step, but again, to those businesses, this does no way make you whole. But this is a part of what we've done every time in this country when we've asked people to step back and sacrifice. It was asking Ford Motor Company to quit making automobiles and make armaments for World War II. We made sure we compensated them, paid them, and keep folks working. That'll be coupled with unemployment benefits for folks who were not able to continue working. Uh, this is probably one of the, if not the most robust state package of support in the nation. I am feeling also very helpful that this package, another one can come on top of it from the federal government that sounds like that may happen this week. Those things should allow for some cushion to those businesses until we bridge this gap and get into the new year. So we're keeping the hand on the dial. I'm asking you, we're not out of the woods. You still need to do those basic things. And the reason for it is we can't overwhelm the healthcare system. We don't know the long-term effects of infections on this. We are still at a dangerously high level of community spread. Our ICU capacities are very high. Our test positivity rates was 11.6% today still. It should be under five before we can start breathing a sigh of relief. And um, our deaths were at 92. But you brought the curve down. You made the sacrifices necessary. Space is starting to open up. And that sunshine I told you about is here. The COVID vaccines are here and more are on the way. So 
We'll continue to monitor this. We'll continue to make the hard decisions as Minnesotans to save our neighbors. And if we do so, we can make a difference. So now I'd like to uh, introduce to you Dr. Ken Holman, the CEO of CentraCare. As I said earlier, an expert in the delivery of care, understands the business and the humanity behind healthcare delivery, but more importantly, understands how you do this in, uh, in a rural setting. And uh, with that, Dr. Holman. Good afternoon and thank you, Governor. Uh, you mentioned nine months ago. And uh, while you were speaking, I was reflecting on nine months ago. Thank you for nine months of collaboration. Uh, early on when the pandemic hit Minnesota, there's a recognition that this is really a, a once in a generational, once in a hundred year episode of public health crisis. So for nine months, we have been collaborating with the governor, Commissioner Malcolm and their entire team in remarkable ways. That collaboration includes the other health systems of Minnesota and hospitals through the Minnesota Hospital Association, as well as many others, as we have tried to deliver equipment, drugs, and people to take care of you, the citizens of Minnesota. Our 13,000 employees have had a common purpose the last nine months. How do we provide care during this COVID pandemic? How do we provide care for the other health care needs of our citizens? And how do we support our community? And I know I join with the other health care leaders in our state as they all have united behind that common purpose. So where are we at today? I'm going to start with a story. Last week I rounded in the critical care unit, one of our critical care units at St. Cloud Hospital. And I'd like to have you picture a ward with a hallway down the middle with 35 ICU beds full of patients suffering from severe COVID on a ventilator, unable to see their family, multiple drugs going at the same time, folks all over trying to help, a remarkable dedication by our staff. And I uh, stopped and talked to one of our young male nurses probably 35, and I asked him what was going on, how the day was going. And uh, he certainly talked professionally, but what struck me was the end of the comment when he talked about how he was scared to go home to his pregnant wife with their first child. Because he was scared of, of bringing the virus home and infecting his wife and his unyet born baby. And um, Talking through that, it certainly emphasized to me, and the governor has mentioned it, and Jan has mentioned it, the enormous personal toll that this is taking on our workers. We have planned, we have collaborated, but it still not, does not obviate the toll that it has taken on our workforce and on you, the citizens of Minnesota. Most recently, our work has been to try to manage the surge that has been repeatedly mentioned. We have increased our capacity for both medical surgical beds, ICU beds. We have had to delay procedures or postpone procedures and visits. We have had sometimes up to a thousand of our employees who are unable to work on any given day for a number of really good reasons. So in the context of a surge and a pandemic that is unparalleled in human history since 1918 at least, how do we come together to work and take care of each other. As the governor mentioned, though, there is hope. The most recent numbers indicate that while our numbers are still way too high, you have helped us with the curve. And that's what I'd like to reemphasize as I talk to this young male nurse. I have frequently asked, what can we do differently? And our physicians and nurses and this young male nurse simply said, Spread the message that we don't want people to die. Spread the message around masking, hand washing, social distancing. Pass the message of personal accountability. And you listened. As the governor mentioned, the last two to three weeks have seen the numbers flatten out and even start to decrease, although they are still too high. So while I deeply appreciate 
We all deeply appreciate your engagement. I am worried. I am worried about the next few weeks as the end of the year approaches, and I continue to worry about the strain on our staff and facilities and on our citizens. We have a weekly conference between the 400 leaders in Centricare. And one of our young leaders two weeks ago said something that was extraordinarily profound. And he said the following, the number one and most important calling of your life is the next six months. Hmm, the next six months. In other words, as leaders, how do we come together and manage the next six months? So I would finish with some comments about that word together. How do we together manage the spread of this virus until we have some notion of herd immunity? Together, how do we collectively embrace measures that keep the public safe through hand washing, masking, social distancing, and the many other initiatives that are undertaken? Together, how do we support our businesses, our schools, the toll on all of us is remarkable. We can do more. How do we support each other differently and better together? And that hope of tomorrow around the vaccine requires us to be together. The vaccine will be useless unless we collectively together get vaccinated so that we can put this virus behind us. So the theme that I would embrace for our organization is a relentless commitment to our patients and our communities together. And I would finish with one of my favorite holiday stories. And it relates to the Christmas truce of 1914. And put yourself in World War I where there's death and misery everywhere. And out of the trenches comes troops on both sides singing Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, Silent Night. So in this holiday season, let's all get together, find ways to support each other better, enjoy this special season, and look forward to a new tomorrow. Thank you, Governor. Thank you to Ken Center Care and all of our uh, all of our hospital systems. We are blessed to have you. Um, we are grateful for it, um, and we're going to go over and take some questions here in just a few minutes um, over at Revenue. But but I would end with Ken. Thank you for that message. Thank you for the the together piece, Minnesotans. We can see the end of this thing. Ken's right. We got six months to show who we are, and you've shown it. You've fought this thing. You've cared for your neighbors. You've weathered this. And as I've said before, and I said it in uh, March. Um, we'll get through this because we're a resilient people full of grit and goodwill. We care about our neighbors and we know what it means to be that decent neighbor. So let's continue on with it. Let's get through this. Thank you, Minnesota.